business with a servant's heart. Servant's heart. Welcome to the podcast. Inspiration, motivation, take servant's heart. Listen to the podcast. We're all about to talk about life. Our guests will share their life story. We want you to success in life and business. We're ready and we will start shortly. We're gonna talk about life, we're going to speak on business You're gonna shine bright, we are going to witness Business with a servant's heart, servant's heart. With hosts Steve Ramon and Ray Ramona. Inspiration, education, talks servant's heart. Listen to the podcast Steve Ramona. Brainshare Business Mentors proudly presents Brainshare.us, the ultimate business education platform, delivering the proven systems, processes, tools, and knowledge that empower you to build the business of your dreams. With 13 high-powered courses encompassing over 240 lessons accessed online on your schedule. Running a business is the hardest thing you'll ever do. We've helped thousands of business owners gain the leadership, communication, and business skills needed to build the business of their dreams. We can help you. Choose your learning path. Scuba Squad is the premier membership program for today's business leaders with access to all Brainshare material and double our money-back guarantee. Brainshare Basics, the ultimate business framework course, a hard-hitting 13-week program to lay the necessary foundation to build the business of your dreams or take individual courses as you need them. Every course has dozens of lessons with video, practical exercises, precise documentation, and the opportunity for direct feedback from a Brainshare mentor. All programs have our exclusive 30-day money-back guarantee. No questions asked, don't wait. Choose your path and start today. Welcome to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart podcast. Doing business and life with a purpose, serving others, and achieving success. I'm your host, Steve Ramona. We created this show for you because we want everyone to be motivated, inspired, and educated to learn how to do business, and more importantly, live life to make an impact in the world. I want you to think of how you're going to serve today and what impact are you going to create with that service. I want to thank my sponsors, uh, Brainshare.us, build a business that works without you, discover how to create a self-sustaining business that thrives even in your absence. You can have a business that doesn't tie you down will guide you through the steps to build an enterprise that operates smoothly without your constant oversight. Visit Brainshare.us to learn how to set the foundations for a business that stands the test of time. With Brainshare Business Mentors, you can build a business that works without you. And PitchDB, successfully connect with 11,000 conferences and 3 million podcasts to be a guest and build your thought leader platform. Learn how to scale your business and your network is your net worth. Well, audience, um, I've, I met this couple a couple of days ago, and they've already extremely impacted my life. Um, please sit down. Please get Kleenex, because I know the first time I met, we cried together. And I'm completely open to say that, because it, it is, this is a story, I'm going to lose it already, a story that you probably heard before. But what's more important is he became a servant, a servant heart. When he could have gone the other way and nobody would have complained, but he's out there helping people. I want to welcome Terry and Alfonso to the show. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. You're, you're very welcome. Let, Alfonso, let's get into it. Let's tell the story. Um, First of all, hello, everyone. And um, I just want to thank Steve for giving me this opportunity and this platform to be able to share my story. Um. It's a story that I hope to to inspire someone um, that is listening. Um, one thing I realized um, through through my ordeal is that each one of us have a have a calling on our lives, and irregardless to what direction we go in, God is still there to protect us, to sustain us, and to guide us according to what His will is. So my story began in 1985 when I was 17 years old. And I was um, I was arrested um, by the Milwaukee Police Department, um, and my mother was informed at the time that I wasn't in any trouble, but um, I just needed to be questioned about um, a murder that happened in the community. Um, and so 
we had no concerns, none whatsoever, because we trusted um, what the police were saying, that I wasn't in any trouble. They just wanted to question me. They never said as to why they wanted to question me. They just said um, they just um, was, was canvassing the community and they was talking to all uh, teenage young black uh, boys. Um, and so I was um, taken into custody. And so after 12 hours, uh, and at that particular time, um, I didn't know how to read um, or write. Um, in fact, later on, I was to, um, I was described. I mean, I was described as uh, functionally literate, which means that um, I never maintained a, a position. I dropped out of, of junior high school, so I wasn't able to maintain um, any uh, functional um, ability that a person of sixteen or seventeen year old, year old was able to sustain. And so, because of those things, I just fell into um, the traps of the streets. Um, and what I mean by the traps of the streets is that um, I just started hanging out with other guys that looked like me, that was angry like me, that spoke like me, um, and just had feel, felt that though they failed um, our families and the community. And I hung out with these guys, and and I realized that at, even at an early age that something was different about my life, but I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. I was never comfortable in the elements that I was in, but I knew that it was a greater calling on my life. And so to fast forward um, at 17, when I was in car, when I was in the interrogation room, um, after 12 hours, that's when the detectives came to me. They was like, well, your mother is in the, in the conference or in the conference room waiting on you. So only thing you have to do is just sign these documents and you and you'll be free to, re to be released into her custody. So me believing that what they said, because they was in a position of authority and because they was in a, in a position, what I believe to be truth, um, I signed the documents and no one ever read anything back to me. Um, no one ever re, um, told me what I was being transferred for or being questioned for. The only thing I knew was is that they was questioned about a murder that I had no op knowledge whatsoever about. And so after 12, like again, after 12 hours, I signed the document with the expectation that I was going to be released into the custody of my mother. And an hour or so after I signed the documents, they came back and they said well, I was being transferred. I was going to be transferred to uh, a children's center. And I was like, well, why was I being going to be transferred? I thought my mother was in the lobby waiting on me. And then it was like, well, she can come pick you up Monday morning. And this was a Saturday. Um, so I went to the, um, they transferred me to the children's center in Milwaukee. And Monday morning, I had no idea why I was in their custody. Nobody would inform me as to what my mother had no idea where I was at. So eventually, um, I was um, called to meet with an attorney and I met with this, this person. I told him what happened in the interrogation room and his response was those things don't happen. That don't happen in the United States in 1985. But I was like, but it did, it, it did happen. And this is the truth behind it. So I had this, this public defender and he never investigated. I had had an alibi witness that put me distance away from where the actual murder happened. There were people who, who, who begged the system to to allow them to come to court and testify, and they wouldn't allow them to do so. So all these things was was held from us um, during that process, and so I was waived into adult court. And eventually, after probably like approximately a hundred days, I was found guilty of first degree murder and sent to prison for a hundred years. Um, I had no idea. I had no idea. I. I I saw this on TV. I I heard about it, um, but I can I could have never imagined that this nightmare would happen to me. So, with me being inexperienced in the type of environment that I was thrust into, I had no idea of who to contact to tell them that I was innocent of the murder that, that I was convicted of. I had no idea of who to cry out to and tell them, listen. I'm I'm just a kid who was just trying to figure my way out. I didn't do it. And I didn't have those um I didn't have those 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 different things in my life to be able to to really understand why I was placed in that position. And so when I went to when I went to Green Bay Correctional Institution, my first 5 years there, 
I was like, well, if they think I'm an animal, if they think I'm a killer, if I'm if they think I'm all these things, well, I would I would try my best to become those things. Mm -hmm. And so for the first five years, um, I went on the tear where I tried to live a life that I wasn't. I was not a killer, but I tried to be that. And so I started getting into a lot of different fights and different conflicts. And that, as a result of that, I ended up been spending five years in segregation. And during that course of my being in segregation, there was this chaplain that came to me, Chaplain Paul Emil. And he would come to me, He the first time he came to me, everything that he represented, I hated. I hated God, I hated our society, I hated the church because I couldn't understand why everybody abandoned me, you know, to that point. And so he came to my cell and I, I remember thinking that I have so much hatred towards this human being and I would, I, and I would make sure that he would not return to my cell again. So I would 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 urinate in um in a milk carton, and I would wait for him, and I would throw the urine on him when he come to my cell, and present that good news or the gospel to me. And there was never a negative reaction that he would give me, but instead he would give me a a, a, a powerful look of compassion. And I remember whenever he went away, I felt so guilty and I felt so convicted where I felt that I need to respond to his love accordingly, but I didn't know how to. I didn't want to appear to be weak or or soft or anything like that. So for a month straight, he would come and routinely I would sit there and I would have this urine ready for him. So about two months into my, 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 my solitary confinement, he came to my cell again, but this time he came differently. He came with a towel wrapped around his neck and then he came with with a with a chair, and he 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 put the chair uh, uh he put the towel on the on the back of the of of the chair. So he came to my cell again, and I dashed him with the urine, and he wiped himself, and he went, and uh he went and he grabbed he grabbed the chair with the towel, and he came in front of my cell, and he sat in his chair, and he said, "Alfonso, I love you, and so do God." And God has has a has a bigger purpose for your life. He said, I don't know why are you angry. I don't know why are you in prison, but God has something greater for you. And I told him, How could God have something great for my life when I, I'm given a life sentence for something I didn't do? Yeah. And nobody believed me. So he told me, I believe you. He said, I believe you. And when he told me that, I believed him. So time and time again, he would come down there. But each time he came down, he would come with a book. And the first time he came with a book, I told him, I said, Pastor, I can't read. I don't even know how to write. And he said, OK, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's something that we can work on. That's something we can work on. Yep. So week after week. He would come down with a, a kid, a child book, a coloring book. And with this coloring book, it was a picture that I was supposed to color in, but I had to match the photo to the word. And I did that over a period of time where I grew confident. But more importantly, I grew confident in that he really loved me and that he really believed in me. So he introduced me to the gospel. He said, man, God... It's not the cause of your confusion, but he's going to reward you much more than what you think right now. Mm -hmm. The suffering that you experience is only temporary. What God has for you, you have to ask him and he's going to reveal it for you. It's not going to be easy for you, but he's going to help you through whatever. And I'm going to be here for you. So I told him, okay, pastor, I believe you. So I got familiar with these books. He started bringing me more advanced books. He started bringing me other books that was more, much more challenging to read, but I was committed to learning whatever it can because it was one person that saw something in me that I couldn't see at my time, at that time, but I believed him. So he started bringing me these books and then he brought me to King James. 
And I remember sitting in the seg and I opened up the King James and I saw that like the revelation of Joseph, that Joseph had to go through a, a season of his life where he had to be removed from his family, that he had to be in the belly of the prison and that he had to go through those type of things, but he still had to celebrate his God. He still had to believe and trust that he was placed in that prison for a reason. And I knew that I was placed in that prison for a reason. So once I began to, to find out who I was as a person, that's when I discovered the child that was in me needed to be loved. He needed to be appreciated. So I reached that child within me and I loved him and I appreciated him. And now I begin to see that no, the suffering is not for me. The suffering is for me to grow up and be able to be a word, to be a word of encouragement to other people. So I decided that I'm gonna stop looking at prison as being a punishment because it, it, I wasn't supposed to be there in the beginning. But I'm gonna start looking at it as being a form of higher education and being a mission field for the kingdom. So I started focusing on not only getting my education, but making sure that other brothers and that was incarcerated get their education. I didn't want them to return back to our community the same as that as they had came in. So I wanted the healing to take place. So I created other groups and programs in prison. I reached out to the community and let them know what the needs of the men are and how we are desperate in need for the community to reach out to us, to love us so we can be transformed, so we can be productive members in our community. And I saw these same hurt people coming back. So I told God, okay, use me according to what your will is. Yeah. And once I committed myself to God, I knew that I had to be in that place of suffering for a while in order to graduate to the point where I'm at now. So I did those things. People began to see that. So the, the warden got in contact with the Wisconsin Innocent Project over a period of time. And once they got in contact with the Wisconsin Innocent Project, they jumped on board. And there was a lot of struggles because Milwaukee said that they have no had no records of me in prison for that murder. And I was like, but I'm in prison for the murder. Y'all convicted me of that. Why are y'all de de denying the truth? So I fought and I fought and I fought. And finally, the Innocence Project submitted, submitted some paperwork to the parole board. And the parole board finally agreed after 32 years that yes, there were some there were some discrepancies that went on behind this guy being in prison because he shouldn't have never been here in the beginning. So they re released me on un unconditional parole, meaning that I didn't have to su submit to an um, a PO or anything. I can still live my life, but I got out with a heavy burden because I still had the burden of being guilty in the system, even though people knew I wasn't. I still had to go through those corrective measures. So when I went up. When I got out 2017, I was like, I was still that 17 year old kid. I didn't know how to function out here. And I didn't know how to tell people that, man, for all these years, I was tortured. I was I was forced to do things and say things that I did not believe in. I was allowed to see people die in prison. I was allowed to see people commit suicide. I don't know why I, I was allowed to, to, to live throughout those things. But I thank God that I did. I was able to see stuff that I could not believe that human beings go through. And once I was released, I was like, no, I'm committed to that. And I started out and I started going to places and I started sharing with them not only my story, but the love and forgiveness of God. If I can do it, if I can look the person in the face that, that sentenced me to prison and that lied on the witness stand and tell you I love you in regards to whatever, it's not about that. You don't realize that God used you to allow me to become the man that I am. So what you did was not a bad thing. It was your truth. My truth is, is that now I have a voice to be able to, to shout from the mountaintop and say, freedom at last. We all yeah. are liberated in the kingdom of God. That's what my story is. And that's why I'm trying to get the message out. And, and Alfonso, I'm going to let you take a break. Is Audience, the reason I have Alfonso and Terry on is... Maybe it's not business, but it's about life. Yeah. Alfonso could have gone the other way, Terry. He could have been woe is me and, and <laughs> still been angry. Oh, and yeah. And you had a servant's heart to help other prisoners, yeah. even though you should not be there. If Alfonso can have a servant's heart, you've proved to me when I met you two days ago that I and anybody else can have a servant's heart. 
I know. With all this baggage and on your shoulders. And let me ask you, it still hurts is why you're crying and, and emotional 40 years later. Why? Um, I think that's a that's like a twofold because at one time nobody believed me. Hmm. At one time it was like everyone around me said there's no hope, but I saw hope. Now I'm living out the vision that God had given me 40 years ago. I'm seeing those things that I spoke about. So now it's not an aha moment, but it's the revelation moment where I was like, okay, I've been always on the on the, on, on the right trail. And irregardless to what other people thought and, and how other people felt or whatever, because I know at the end of the day, it was always the enemy behind things to, to, to dissuade me from moving in the kingdom. So I always was 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 focused on what I had to do and how to get it there. Are you ready to tell your story and change people's lives? Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, was that, that I mean, was always my hope, my friends. It was even in prison and you were thinking that? You're, yes. Yes. That's, that's amazing. I mean, you're, huh? You saw it. I saw oh my goodness. I wrote about it. I wrote about it like well when I was in SEG, um I I I started writing. Um, pretty much the journal and and in my writing I was learning to write and I was learning to read through that and so um, and then I started writing about my emotional uh, struggles and I started writing about the revelation that I received from the Bible and all of a sudden 40 years later those revelations that I have written about at that time it's now been fulfilled so and everything is in writing and everything is in according to what God's will yeah. because this is the seventh year that I've been out Amen. And now I'm living in a year of perfection where everything, I mean, sevenfold plus sevenfold, fold, these are things that God has opened up the kingdom of heaven because he had begun to, 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 to say, okay, good and faithful servant, you suffered well, so now I'm going to reward you. Actually, you wrote about, wrote about being in the mirror. You practiced in the, yeah. mirror, in the mirror speaking to people. And my, and and my handwriting. <laughs> and my handwriting. I was... And in fact, Steve, I think there was like two months of no beginning of the year. The Holy Spirit woke me up early in the morning. And I told Terry, I said, Well, I gotta go. I gotta go. So I drove to um by the lake, lake which which is something I normally do because the lake represents a, a sea of people. Because in Revelation, that's that's what it's uh referred to. So I went to I went to the lake and I sat in my car for a second, and all of a sudden in, I had a dream the night before where my my soul was removed from my body while I was I was I was I was uh positioned in a fetal position um facing the lake and I didn't understand what was going on and so as my as my soul was being removed from my body I saw me laying there and my mouth was covered and my hands was bound and I couldn't understand why um these things would happen to me so I woke up in a panic and I told Terry I got to go to the lake so when I went to the lake the moment I, I I drove there, it was like a that, that was the revelation. The the lake or the or, or the sea represents a massive amount of people, and my mouth was covered because at that time I had not suffered to the point that that breakthrough had arrived yet, and my hands was bound because I wasn't really willing or ready or prepared to tell what the truth was. And so for all these years, I had been ashamed of the gift that God has given to me. So at that day. That I went to the lake. That was the power of the revelation that had that that I really discovered that okay, the sea of people meaning that I have to go and share this word because it's great news. Amen. You said hope a few times. What does hope mean to you? Oh my goodness. Hope mean means to me is is, is looking be, beyond the impossible, hmm. looking beyond the impossible. When the world say you can't. Or where mom and dad say you can't, or when your sibling or when your 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 significant other say you can't, but that one hope always gonna let you know that there's that glimmer of hope. So you may have to go through some things in order to get there, but hold on to that. Yeah. yeah. What about your hope packing? <laughs> and I used to like every morning, Steve, for 32 years, when I first went to Green Bay every morning because I, I knew that I didn't belong there. So I used to, I used to, in my cell, I used to uh, fold my, my mattress, excuse me. I used to fold my mattress, also fold my linen, 
and I didn't have any any personal items like a TV or radio. So everything I have was institution um, I'm given. So I used to fold these things, sit on the edge of my bed. And when the guard walked past and he saw all of my um, um, worldly materials in my cell that was packed, he would say to me, Mr. James, what are you doing? I said, like, man, I'm going home. I'm going home. And this was in 85. And I said, I'm going home. He said, no, no, no. You're not going home. You're a lifer. You're a lifer. You might as well get settled in. I said, no, sir. I would never get settled in for 32 years straight. I continued to do that until finally at the 32nd year, they came to my door and they opened my door and they said, you were released. Was, was was about to be released. And my my linen and everything was already packed up because I was in a position of readiness because I saw this. That is what hope is. Oh my God. Oh my God. Alfonso, you, you just, you know, my head's spinning. I'm emotional. But one thing I want to ask is, um, you really hit me. Um, what's your future look like? <laughs> Listen, do you see this? <laughs> yes. Brother. Yes. Oh my goodness. I have I have new friends like you. <laughs> I have a beautiful, beautiful helpmate Help that company me. helpmate. <laughs> that come Steve know what I'm saying. I trust me. He knows. Oh what yeah, amen. Yeah, exactly. And uh you're about to get a play. Yeah. And and <laughs> to be able to go to the lake, it's small things to be able to go out there and hug a tree. <laughs> To be able to go see my mother and tell my mother I love you and hold her in my arms. To be able to go Amen. see my daughter who was two months old. To be able to go hold my baby who's now pregnant with the baby and be effective in her life. Can't nobody tell me that hope is not real. So the hope of my future, oh my goodness. I see acres and acres and acres where we have a place where people are able to go heal. Yeah. I see acres and acres of place where people are able to go and be themselves, to get away from the worries of the world, just to be yourself. There's no cost, there's no nothing. The only thing you have to do is bring yourself. So that's the space that I'm trying to create for, for people that I know that don't have the means, don't have the resources to be able to step outside of their community, the four block radius, to step outside their pain, to step outside their anger. I think a lot of our questions lies within the child within. Create a space where that child within is able to be safe. And play. And play. And play. <laughs> and play. So this, and, and, and I have a, and then we're looking at a building right now. I'm looking at a building where, and, and it, this, this building is a building where when I was a teenage, a uh, troubled teenage kid, I used to go to this place and it was a safe haven. It was a it was a place where there was nothing but love. And so this same place that I grew up going to is now vacant. Abandoned. Abandoned. Yeah. And every time I place this building, and Steve, for the record, I'm right back in the community where I was arrested. I'm right back volunteering in the wow. very place that I was arrested. Yeah. I'm loving the same people. I'm loving the same people. No matter what. So now... This building that is vacant, I told Terry when we passed there, I'm claiming that. Every time. I'm claiming that. That's my, I see the vision of how it is able to bring healing, yeah. to able to bring about all these powerful things. For men that are in prison, know that your kids are safe and their education is being provided for. That's the avenue that I want to create. And when the men are or women are released from prison, they have a safe... I'm connected with a tip agency here that whoever have a felony record when they release from prison, rather than looking any place, I have a job for them. I have a job yeah. and, 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 it's, and it's able to provide them with a decent living. And now we're working on finding shelters for these very same guys where our community and our society says, okay, second chances, third chances, no. Those are the people that we should love the most. Amen. So, that's a, that. That is what my goal is, my friend. Uh, it's, I'm going to support you, and I've got some great ideas. We'll talk later. <laughs> oh. uh, we're at the end, but I have to ask you this: People listening, a month, a week from now, a month from now, five years from now, what would you tell somebody that's been through a trauma like you've been? What what advice would you give them? Oh my goodness, the thing that I wake up every morning is 
is that you have to wake up with an attitude of gratitude. In regards to what your circumstances are, not to minimize it or anything, there's always somebody who has gone through or are in a much worse situation than you are. So we have to just come to terms that like, okay, how am I, how should I be defined? Should I come out angry? Should I come out bitter? Or should I come out victorious so I can be a voice for other people? Because I know that whatever I suffer, there is many, many more that suffers in similar ways. And so that's why I think that the message should be in our suffering and what hope looks like and what faith looks like. And as I always say, Terry, I want the last word from the woman. Oh, yeah, yeah, Steve, I was just, I What's was, your thoughts? I was just, I wanted to have the last word <laughs> because my thoughts are when I first met Alfonso and he showed up with that big smile on his face and with joy and for like joy and love. It was like, woo, out. I thought, I'm not the most incredible human being that has gone through this horrific thing and walks in love and um, love and forgiveness. And then I think my head was like, nah, that can't be. There must be something else different behind that. Like, the, what is that real? And I think the last word is that it is real, that um, it is real, that, that, that somehow throughout all of it, Alfonso retained love in his heart and found his way to forgiveness and really like finds joy in like you said, the, the big things in life, about to get on his first airplane ride, that's exciting. But, but also the small things in life of like walking out the door and being able to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee in the morning, that things that yeah. we take for granted. So it's just a gift to be able to be in the presence and be reminded about daily, you know, minute by minute, how just precious how precious life is mm. and how beautiful and that how grateful to be um you know to be here in this in this one precious life that we have so i'm um i'm in awe really i'm in awe of the truth of it um yeah well yeah. that's really the best final word alfonso i couldn't have i picked the right one there not that you couldn't have done it <laughs> yes and what's so exciting for me is one, I'm excited for the future because I want to be part of that and help Please. you guys. Oh, you. But audience, this message is going to live forever and we're going to get them on other platforms. And that's just not mine, but you're having a bad day. This is why I was thinking through the whole conversation. I'm going to open up a part of this show and listen to it. If I'm having a bad day, I want wow. you to do the same thing. Pull wow. the show up, save it to the side, fail. whatever way you watch it, listen to it, whatever. Pull it up and make your day. You don't have to listen to 25, 30 minutes. Take five minutes of it. Go forward and backward on the go forward and backward buttons on podcasts. That's the beauty of them. And inspire <laughs> yourself each day. And I'll make clips, just so you know, audience. You look out on YouTube. I'm going to make little 60 second clips that I'm going to use and hope that you will use as well. Don't forget about my TV show, Together We Serve, on Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific and 5 p.m. Eastern. My podcast swag, doing business, servants' hearts, hats, t shirts. All kinds of different things. Also, too, I want to thank you all for especially listening and watching this show because I've done all 318 shows, 315 wow. shows. This one hit me hard. And I know when I get out of here, my classes are going to be fogged up again. And <laughs> I, I thank you for listening. But look for the next episode of Doing Business with the Serpent's Heart. See you all.